On January 19th, 2002, Tom Brady fumbled the ball late in the AFC Championship game against the Oakland Raiders. Or did he? The play ultimately was ruled an incomplete pass, eventually being placed into NFL legend as the Tuck Rule. The Patriots would win and Tom Brady started his legendary Super Bowl victory run that year. And many argue this play should have been called a fumble. But the bottom line is Tom Brady's first Super Bowl victory arguably came down to a call by an NFL official. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is January 13th, 2019. Yeah, that's not that long ago. This was a playoff game between the New England Patriots and the San Diego Chargers. The game was pretty lame, if you ask me. I mean, if you weren't a Patriots fan, you're like, well, first quarter, checking out of this one, but it had a different type of significance. The reason is because Sarah Thomas became the first female official to officiate an NFL playoff game. Now, she was the first female official back in 2015, but this is only one thing that shows the evolution of the official in football. There's a quote from NFL.com's site that kind of regards the officials changing throughout history, and it goes as such. Officiating crews from professional football's earliest days would not be recognizable to today's fans, and not just because of their attire and their use of horns rather than flags to call penalties. Now, their attire back then, they wore white pants, white shirt, white hat with a black bow tie. Not like the zebra officials that we see today. And back then, the level of professionalism, now that was very weak as well. And it was just kind of like a bunch of dudes together, just kind of you know, throwing out the horns whenever they wanted to, under-trained, ill-equipped, and they were also poorly supervised. And having this, you know, bunch of dudes that weren't supervised that well, they were ill-equipped and everything, they kind of contributed to the low-scoring, sluggish style of rumble-tumble, rough-and-tumble kind of play in the NFL. And professional football was not going to grow unless the officiating crew would improve. So one thing that they did was back in 1929, they added a fourth position. Now, up until this time, there were only three officials on the field. This fourth position would be the field judge, which would rule on pass interference and illegal blocks. You know, you got to keep up with the times. You got these uh, passing leagues starting to come in the thing. You got to throw balls all over the place. You got to be able to pay attention to the illegal blocks and the pass interference. But after that, there were not a whole lot of major changes to the officiating crew until 1938 which this is considered the first true turning point in the officiating history and lore of the NFL. You see, in 1938, the first thing that they did was they would take these officials, you know, four of them, and they would give them dedicated positions. They had the referee, the umpire, a headlinesman, and a field judge. And it was, you are a referee, or you are an umpire. Not this whole just randomly, each game, let's draw it out of the hat and figure out who gets what position, you know? That way, we had more specialized referees and officials out there on the field. The other thing that really happened during 1938 season was they hired Hugh Ray, which was nicknamed Shorty, as the NFL supervisor of officials and, you know, technical advisor pretty much. Now they're going to have, we'll have more on him on the next episode because, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a hint bomb for you, not the secret but deadly kind, but. And although this dude was a little bit of a tiny fellow, he uh, only stood five foot six, 136 pounds, he was still a giant in professional football. He was known for many things. And there's a quote that came from Mark Duncan, the NFL supervisor to the officials between the 1964 and 1968 season, that kind of summed up how he proceeded with his evolution of the NFL official. And it went as such. He pounded the rules into his officials so that they could average 95% of a test at a coaching clinic on even the most difficult problems. Before that, they couldn't really reach that score, even with the book open at their elbow. And he was really a pioneer, you know, in maintaining the rules that still exist today. And to make sure you don't miss next week's episode covering Shorty's impact on the game, 
I ask that you subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. Also, please take a look at the show notes for links and other related videos on the subject covered here, either through your podcast player or heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Now, getting to some of uh, Shorty's major focuses, he really drilled into the officials professionalism and innovative thinking to provide the best possible product through the NFL. Now, he didn't stop there, but we're going to talk more about that in the next episode, like I said. But to kind of sum it up for you as far as what one major contributor to the NFL thought about Shorty Ray, it went as such from George Hallis. Getting the league to hire Shorty Ray was my finest contribution to pro football. Now that's a tall order from a dude that has had a lot of contributions to the NFL. The aforementioned Mark Duncan, like I talked about, he said that he required officials to take yearly tests and attend preseason clinics. And then in 1968, the second major turning point for the officiating crew. This is when Art McNally was named the NFL Supervisor of Officials, and he would hold this position until 1991. So we're talking a long time here. Under Art McNally's leadership, the NFL would create the modern evaluation and grading system for officials. I mean, you can't improve what you can't track, right? So by tracking it, they would help improve each week how the officials performed on the field because they had an assessment of how they performed the previous week and how they could make adjustments to be able to improve for the next week and beyond. And to understand his expectations, this is Art McNally, that is, from the NFL website, there's a quote, and it went as such. When asked if an official in the right position on the field will make the right call 9 out of 10 times, McNally responded, higher than 9 out of 10 times. It better be or he'll be out of the business. He won't be around for long. And part of this, you know, whole expectations factor, McNally was a former Marine, so he had discipline at the core of his beliefs. But when he was at the helm, also, he was confident in the officials doing their best job. A quote from McNally went as such, Overall, the caliber of our officiating is excellent. I grade the films eight hours a day, so I should know. And this brings us to the four-step weekly evaluation of the officials that I discussed. This is how they would grade each official during the tenure of McNally for how they performed on the field and how they can improve the next week. The first step, McNally and his aides reviewed the game film and noted all fouls that were called and the official that called them. Then step two, the team would take each foul that was called and they would grade them on a one to seven point scale, where one would be given a poorest grade and seven was an excellent grade. Step three, McNally would look for plays with a no call, you know, believing that there should have been a whistle on this one, you know. So we're all sitting there talking. We're thinking about the NFL uh, champion, NFC championship game this past year and the Saints and the Rams and that no call. But I'm pretty sure they were given a bad call on that one grade. Step four, they would go beyond the calls. The team graded the officials on position and mechanics as far as where they were positioned on the field and the mechanics of how they would call and make everything else happen. So these four steps that McNally created would help the internal team decide how well the official performed on the field. But it wasn't just the internal team that would make decisions. Beyond this, we had the referee of the game, an NFL observer from a stadium press box, and each team's coach would submit grades that they felt the officiating team had on that game to the official department. With all this information at his fingertips, McNally would compile their reports, then he would send it out each week to the officiating team so they could see what they were doing and what he expected them to improve upon. Now back in the day, McNally's team, they would project games on a huge white wall where they would, you know, have to have all these different kind of non-technological advances because it, when they started, you know, like I said, 68, they didn't have a lot of, you know, just plug it in the internet and DVD, YouTube and that kind of thing and we could just boom, bam, watch it right away. They had to go through it very meticulously. And he dreamed of a central command center for officiating. Unfortunately, it wouldn't happen for him, but it would come to fruition in the 1990s, a little bit after he was gone. He was also responsible for creating specialists at the officiating positions. He would organize meetings by position where every crew member could discuss problems that they were having. I mean, we talked about the specialization as far as the NFL rules where they would allow players to make substitutions to improve the impact and the scoring and everything else, excitement of the game. 
Same thing goes for officials, because if they can focus on specifically their tasks, even though they have to care about the whole game, if you can focus on specifically your task, then you have a better chance at improving your craft. And a quote from uh, Hall of Fame coach Don Shula kind of explained what a lot of people thought about this guy, and a win as such. Because of Art's honesty, integrity, vast experience, and dedication, no coach disregards what he has to say. So after we discussed Art McNally here, let's go over some of the milestones with the officiating team as a whole. We talked about back in 1929, they added that fourth position. Then 1938, they would specialize the positions and give them, you know, designated lines. Well, in 1947, this is when you know, there was an increase in passing plays, so they had to kind of keep up. They would add the fifth official. This was the back judge, which was responsible for the downfield passing game. Then in 1965, there was a sixth position added. This was the line judge. They uh, put this in particularly because of scrambling quarterbacks like Fran Tarkenton, who would just roam all over the field and they were tossing the ball. And you weren't quite sure, did they pass the line? Were they over the scrimmage line? We don't know. So that was one of the big reasons why they interjected this sixth official into the play. Then moving on to 1978, this is when we had the seventh position added. This was the side judge. One thing that, going back to Coach Don Shula, he said that, you know, he urged for this position because there were defensive backs that were getting away with way too much. We talked about this a little bit over in the rules episode last week as well, you know, with the whole guy getting roughed down the field and couldn't get past anything because they just tackled him pretty much, so he fought for it. The side judge would position 20 yards down from the line of scrimmage, which he would watch the receivers down the field. With this addition, there now would be an official assigned to each eligible receiver down the field, which were the five eligible receivers. Then way skip it over to 2010. This is when we moved the umpire from the defensive side of the ball to the offense behind the quarterback. I wondered why it took so long because how many times did you see where the umpire was crushed in the middle of the field between a receiver and defensive back that were crossing over the middle or even on a running play he'd get smoked because you know that's like right there where all the action is and I I don't know why it took him so long but it was good that at least in 2010 they finally made that move. From 2010 to 2014 they tested an eighth position which was the deep judge. This was only during the preseason games but let's go back to 1975. You see, this is the point where we talk about technology changing the way that the refs would play the game. Well, I mean, they wouldn't really, you know, play the game. They play their own game within the game because they'd have to try to make sure that the game was being played by the rules. And this total game changer back in 1975, they would add the wireless microphones to the refs so they could now communicate with fans in the stands as well as on television. I mean, up until then, it was just the hand signals and hoping that the guy announcing the game would give you the right call and all that kind of thing. But now we had where the NFL official could communicate directly with the fans so they could get live, real-time information right to their ear holes. But before, you know, this uh, transition, anonymity was viewed that the refs did their job right. Because if you didn't hear about the official, well, they must have done the right thing because no one has to question any of their calls. But now with this microphone, personalities could be shown through. I mean, we had, at the time, Mason, Red Cash, and he became famous. In an interview that they talked about in his early career, he got fired because they said he was so monotone that the coaches didn't think that he even cared about it. So when he got this microphone, he used it to his advantage. He would become the famous guy where he'd be like, first down! And then people resonated with it. He'd have, you know, fans when he went to some random place. He talked about being in London and some guy came up to him and goes, first down. I mean, now it's just normal for us to be able to hear the NFL official. But at the time, it was it was pretty unique experience. 1976 was a little another unique type of adventure for the NFL officials. The league would tinker around with the instant replay, but it would not officially become, you know, used in the NFL until 1986. Then they would kind of get away with it in 1992, but they'd bring it back in 1999 for good because they thought that although the official was very good on the field, there had to be times where, you know what, we just got to take a second look at it. Now think about it. One hand, the instant replay could show how the official screwed up, but then it gets the call right. So I got to imagine it was hard for some of the officials to embrace it, especially the long timers. 
but that's maybe neither here nor there. So let's talk about 1991. This is when the league would appoint 16-year veteran Jerry Seaman to the head of the officiating department. During his tenure, he was able to accomplish many things as well. The -the state-of-the-art command center that, you know, Art McNally dreamed of would come to fruition. And at the time, the command center included $500,000 worth of cutting-edge technology. An article from the 1993 edition of Referee Magazine kind of described how they thought about it. And it went as such. We would sit there splicing plays together by hand using a razor blade and an adhesive tape. Now we do it all by computer using digital sequencing and numerical coding to signify exactly where, on any given tape, a particular play is located. I mean, I don't know about you, but it would have been kind of cool to be part of the landmark technologies back in the day, you know, the innovation stuff, where the computer's at the beginning. I mean, I was there, but I don't really remember a whole lot about it. It was like, you know, I was a youngster. And nowadays, we have, I guess, the AI or virtual reality, but it's like, I just want to get back. It'd be cool to, like when the iPhone first came out, those kinds of things. Just interesting to think of how, you know, they described, like I said, the numerical coding to signify exactly where the play was on any given tape. For us, it's like, it's not even a second thought. Of course, yeah. Okay, I'm going to, at 22 minutes and 38 seconds, there's going to be a play. Smashing out the button, let's go there. But getting back to Jerry Seaman. McNally? Now, he was strict with the rules, and Shorty was on point with his details. But Seaman brought the physical fitness requirements to the officiating crew. Under Jerry Seaman, the officials had physical exams and stress tests. They also had the ability to run certain long distance and sprints. Plus, they also had weight goals. Now, he had continuous improvement for his officials. They weren't just going to be able to sit back and, you know, sip on Coca-Cola and eat your donuts and stuff. You had to be able to keep up with the players on the game and be in the right position if you're going to make the right call. And Seaman also took Shorty's 85-page officiating casebook and he updated it. This casebook, it was where, uh, let's say, a for instance kind of thing. You know, we had various scenarios, like a what you're going to kind of do about it kind of thing. He would take it and he would kind of update it to the modern NFL. Because, of course, things change and evolve, so you got to be able to give your officials the, hey, if this happens on this play, what would you kind of do thing? This is what I would do. Hey, let's do that. And like I said, Jerry Seaman was responsible for, uh, back in 1999, they officially brought the instant replay back into the NFL. And this is kind of what he thought about it. People have to understand what the purpose of the replay is. It's a tool to help officials out in very isolated cases. We would love to get every play right, but that isn't always the case. Then in 2014, the NFL Instant Replay system received their biggest boost of all. The Art McNally Game Day Central was opened at league headquarters back in New York. This allowed for Game Day Central to directly communicate with referees and game replay officials. In the same year, the addition of enhanced official-to-official wireless communication systems called O2O, I think it's O2O because of official official, communicate with each other on the field instead of having to be face to face. And I was wondering, you know, sometimes I'm like, how the heck do they make those calls so quick? Like what number play it is when the guy's way down 30 yards down the field? Well, they have these wireless receivers that they can talk to each other, just like the CIA or FBI guys, I don't know, you know, watching the president. After Seaman passed away, Dean Blandino would take over the officiating department up until 2017. Then he'd hand over the reins to Alberto Riverton. To, who, who took over and as the title officially of Senior VP of Officiating. 2017 season is where they'd take another leap forward. This would, during the instant replays, where the consulting would happen between the referee and the command center. But Riverton or another senior official will now decide on all replay reviews, which helps promote consistency throughout all of the replay reviews in the NFL. In another step forward in 2017, the league would hire 21 full-time officials from the 124 that were already on the roster. What this meant was that the NFL now could help, you know, year-round improvement to be able to improve everything related to NFL officiating. And there, most of them are still part-time guys, regular jobs and regular dudes where, you know, they have to focus on NFL officiating, but also have your real-time job and everything. So I got to say, I want to give a big thanks to all of those officials out there because they're dedicated to their craft and they really do make a difference in how we are viewing the NFL games each and every week. 
not the final contribution that he made, but also in 2017, Riverton changed the name of Head Linesman to Down Judge because he felt that it was more gender neutral. And here's a quote why he felt that he should do that. And when is such. I just don't think it's right. We call anybody out by gender, especially this day and age when we welcome everyone into football. And they have robust farm systems and programs and everything else to be able to scout for future officials. But with that being said, the official in the NFL has come a long way since the inception of the league, and the game would not be the same without the evolution of the official. However, there are no officials that have been inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. There aren't too many people that disagree Art McNally deserves to be in. A quote from former referee Jim Tunney described how most felt about McNally, and it goes as such. I will play poker over the phone with Art McNally. That's how much I trusted him. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude, and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets of how the officiating team has evolved throughout the years. Next episode, we're going to get a little more in-depth on the pioneer that started it all back in 1938, Mr. Shorty Ray. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.